Um, before there can be victory, and the victory of Allah Ta'ala, there has to be a level of steadfastness. There's an exposure that's taking place. And it's not just by the way the exposure of the Zionists and the Americans and, and the, the entity of a whole. There's an exposure of every single human being. I think for this younger generation, they feel powerless. And they feel powerless to be able to stop a genocide. There's ample amount of work that supports this now. Was that 24 was a shock moment. The fact that the idea still resonates and is still relevant in the minds of Muslims a hundred years later tells me something. It tells me something that they were unable to eradicate this. They are trying to um, police the thoughts of Muslims in many ways. And, you know, um, it's not only the thoughts of Muslims. Fundamentally, they're going to police what we can teach and what we can't teach from our own tradition. Because when Benjamin Netanyahu is making the case that, you know, um, he's part of a particular civilization, it is true that the Zionist entity is a European construction. It is a representation of Europe in the Arab world. I think this is something that's often missing, and this is the uniqueness of Islam, is that we have Rasul and then we have the Sahaba, and we should look at the Sahaba, the model of the Sahaba itself. You know, this is why, when we talk about the Khulafa Rashidun, it's interesting. They are Rashidun because of their character, not because they're Khalifa. One thing I've learned from Islamic history, this is not supposed to be easy. This was never easy. The ple seeking the pleasure of Allah Ta'ala is not some easy feat. And when you were talking about a hundred years ago, when the Khilafah was abolished, how did people feel? We need to start asking ourselves, if we see the abolishment of Aqsa, how will we feel? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. The Through to the Muslim Podcaster Show. I'm your host Majid. And today I have a very special guest, Dr. Yaqub Ahmed. And for those who may not know, uh, Dr. Yaqub Ahmed is a historian a lecturer who specializes in Ottoman history and Islamic studies and is based in Istanbul. Dr. Yaqub, or Brother Yaqub, shall I say, welcome to the show. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thanks for having me again, bro. Yeah, mashallah, it's uh, the first podcast uh, in the month of Ramadan and no one better to have than yourself. How's Ramadan going uh, with yourself? Uh, alhamdulillah, it's going okay. Um, obviously within reason, I mean, this is a different type of Ramadan in terms of what's happening in terms of the global context, but on a personal note, um, alhamdulillah, uh, Ramadan is Ramadan. It's an opportunity for us to self-reflect. I'm, I'm trying to use this Ramadan a little bit differently than in the past. So inshallah, it can be beneficial and fruitful for me. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Um, yeah, to be honest with you, you can't really disconnect things from what's happening, um, in the world, uh, and to, on that note, to be honest with you, I might as well just get straight into it because you might recall I reached out to you um, when uh, things kicked off in Gaza and you were very busy. And it's been, what, five, six months since then. Um, so I've been following your tweets and stuff anyway, but, uh, you know, what what are your thoughts anyway on on what's going on? Uh, so before I begin, I always start uh, everything at the moment since October the 7th with Auz Bilam Nishtan Rajim, Bismillah Rahim. You know, um, when Rasul Salam died, um, I've mentioned this before, but Aisha Radl Anha, she says that when her father, Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu an, uh, mentions the verses in the Quran or the ayats in the Quran about Rasul Salam is just merely a man, but Allah Ta'ala lives forever. She responds by saying that, you know, when we heard that, it was like we heard it for the first time. And it's intriguing how the Quran, uh, the Quran is a unique kitab because there's no other like it, but I don't think sometimes people appreciate that the kitab is timeless and it's timeless in the sense that it resonates with everyone in every single time, but it also doesn't have a beginning and an end. Meaning you can, you read the, the Quran, I mean in Ramadan we're trying to finish the juz, so we're going through it in, in a linear fashion, but you basically read Quran by just opening it up and reading various surahs and ayats in the way that you see fit. And what's unique about the Quran in of itself is that each ayat can stand independent. It can stand on its own 
Um, the ayat before and the ayat after can provide context at times, but even if that context isn't there, it in of itself is something to do to double over, to do contemplation over, right? In that sense. And Surah Nasr um, reaches out to me because when Gaza happened, I was actually teaching Sirah and um, this Surah came out at me as a, as a way that I've been hearing it for the first time. And the idea is, is that the surah comes about at the time of Hudaybiyah, right? So this is the last surah of the Quran. Um, Hudaybiyah happens, and Allah Ta'ala is reminding the Muslims that, um, you know, in, in, in terms of what they perceive as victory and failure is not what Allah Ta'ala perceives as victory and failure in his wisdom, right? So um, they are unhappy that, they are ready to go to Mecca. They have shaved their heads and, and so forth and the camels and traveling and food and joy and all of that. And they get to Mecca and then they are told that they have to return. And many of the Sahaba were bitterly disappointed. In fact, some of the Sahaba critiqued the the sort of proceedings of Hudaybiyah in the way that Rasulullah had allowed it to happen and thought that this was a, a failure in, in some ways because they couldn't enter Makkah at the time. And so Allah Ta'ala then reveals this surah. And what's unique about this is we say that some of the ulama, they say that the izaja and nasrullah wal fat, that elongation in the beginning on ja, um, the mud, as they say in Arabic, is some of the ulama say is there um, as a way of indicating steadfastness that um, before there can be victory and the victory of Allah Ta'ala, there has to be a level of steadfastness. And this is, he's talking to the community as a whole, that the whole community has to be steadfast. And that this is, steadfastness is not something that happens in, in a minute, it happens over a prolonged period of time, that the steadfastness has to be long in that sense, right? And why this is important is because the Ummah surely have gone through a prolonged period of steadfastness at the time. But we are human beings, and when the goal is in sight, and when we're so close, to then it being snatched away from you, you can see why um, there's a sense of agitation in that sense. And I'll come back to this in a second, so just remind me of that. But then Allah Ta'ala says, Nasrullah wal fat. The Nasr of Allah Ta'ala was beautiful about this word, Nasrullah. It's not just the victory of Allah Ta'ala, that is a reduction of understanding what a Nasr of Allah Ta'ala is. It's also the assistance of Allah Ta'ala, and it's also uh, the forgiveness from Allah Ta'ala. That we are asking when we are looking and searching for victory from Allah Ta'ala. The idea of victory is, is, is there is a humility in it, which is that Allah Ta'ala provides victory in the way that he sees fit, but also there is an element of asking for his assistance and asking for his forgiveness. This is truly the humility that exists in the Muslims. And once he provided the victory, and this is the interesting thing, what Allah Ta'ala perceived, not perceived, that's incorrect. What Allah, what Allah Ta'ala, in his eyes, what was, what was victory and what the Muslims perceived as failure, um, and that's a better word of using for the Muslims, um, you realize then that there is a difference. And that trust in Allah Ta'ala's hikmah and the trust in the Nasr needs to be there in that sense. And this is why this word Nasrullah is so beautiful. And then he says, and then, then the Fat happens. And Fat here is Fat al Makkah. Um, but it also is an indication of the opening of people's hearts towards Islam, whether they convert to Islam or not. And then people come to Islam in their droves. And so post October the 7th, I keep asking myself that is this a Hudaybiyah moment? Where, yes, okay, um, many people have lost their lives. There's a lot of devastation. And there is um, an entity or entities or hegemon um, that is rejoicing in the destruction of Muslims, of which the region has, you know, turned a blind eye to. But there is a lot of exposure that is taking place, which is, I think, a moment that requires steadfastness and this is the point I was saying about going back to it. The steadfastness is not simply a steadfastness of, of the fact that while the crimes are being committed, that we hold on to the rope of Islam and not give up. And the people of Gaza are showing that. But it's also a steadfastness that post 
what happens in terms of the massacres in Gaza, the genocide in Gaza, that when there is an attempt to try to politically reconfigure and change things, that the Ummah will continuously need to be steadfast in the fact that this is possibly not the victory and that the victory is something else in Allah's eyes and plans. And that requires time. And it's unique because I was reading Surah Qasas the other day. Um, I was teaching my students that in the Quran, um, Allah Ta'ala gives us many opportunities of self-reflection. The Quran itself is an indication of self-reflection. And this is what I said, each ayat and the, the, ay the word ayat means sign. So each ayat is a sign that requires reflection in of itself. He also speaks to us about the laws of nature, that nature itself um, needs to be contemplated over in order for us to, to contemplate about his existence. But then he mentions another thing in the Quran, which is um, history, stories, people of the past. And in Surah Al-Qasas, it's a surah about Musa alayhi salam, and it's providing finer details regarding Musa alayhi salam. And Allah Ta'ala starts off by making the case that this is not merely a story, right? Making a particular case here, that don't you see this as some sort of like, uh, you know, kid's book or some narrative that I'm giving you. He wants people to contemplate over this. And what is he asking them to contemplate over? Well, one of the interesting things is that he talks about Musa alayhi salam as a child being, you know, finding his way into the house of Fir'aun because of Allah Ta'ala's um, hikmah. And that Musa alayhi salam, when Fir'aun is committing his crimes, is a baby. He's not an adult. So Allah Ta'ala doesn't send Musa alayhi salam in the beginning of Fir'aun's crimes. He actually sends Musa alayhi salam in a time where Fir'aun was full-fledgedly committing his crimes. And then Musa alayhi salam required that time to become cultivated as a human being to his adulthood. And Fir'aun continued. So in that sense, what you see is that sometimes there's an expectation that we want something to stop immediately, but it may continue. And the reason why it may continue is because a generation is fostered over time. It doesn't break the laws of nature. And Allah Ta'ala has created that particular environment regarding Musa alayhi salam. Now, before, prior to Musa alayhi salam, there were many anbiya who had come with the message of Tawheed before him. So that had already existed in that part of the world. Now, what's interesting then is that Musa alayhi salam becomes an adult in the house of Fir'aun, understands the mechanizations of the way that power operates, understands the culture of power, and then leaves. And then when he leaves, what's interesting is Allah Ta'ala then mentions that Musa alayhi salam did not know that on that day he was going to get Nabur. Just in the same way Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi didn't know in the cave that he was going to get Nabur, right? The idea that Allah Ta'ala is making the case that he's the one who's in charge, that even the Anbiya do not know in that sense, right? And this is one of the things about making a distinction so that people don't worship prophets and that there is some information and knowledge that's withdrawn from them. And then Musa alayhi salam goes to Fir'aun and challenges him. Now what's unique here is we see in the case of Musa alayhi salam, he doesn't have the same power as Fir'aun. He doesn't have the same money as Fir'aun. He doesn't have the same hegemonic um, you know, sophistication as Fir'aun. He doesn't put fear in the hearts of people. But what he has is one, Allah Ta'ala, and what he has too is the Ummah at the time who he's now managing to convince regarding the crimes of Fir'aun. And the, the, the miracles of Musa alayhi salam is not the narrative of a magic stick. The miracles of Musa alayhi salam technically are designed to continuously expose the lies of Fir'aun. That whenever Fir'aun gives an indication of his strength, of his authority, of being in control and so forth, that Musa alayhi salam, with the will of Allah Ta'ala, exposes him by saying, this is just a magic trick. This is just this. This is just that. This is just an illusion. This is just a narrative. The idea here in Surah Al-Qasas is that Allah Ta'ala is showing to the Ummah, and this was the Ummah of Rasul Sallam now, who are listening to this, paying attention. So this is not just to the Yehud and the Nasara, but to the Muslims themselves, because Rasul Salam is now case in point here regarding the Quraysh, that Allah Ta'ala is sufficient for you. And then secondly, that the Ummah need to stick by Rasul Salam and that we will expose them in a way gradually over time. And that exposure will deconstruct and destroy the empire. And I honestly believe that's what's happening right now in terms of victory, what I'm talking about. 
that yes, we've lost a lot of people, um, subhanAllah, and Allah Ta'ala has given them Jannah, but there's an exposure that's taking place. And it's not just, by the way, the exposure of the Zionists and the Americans and, and the, the entity of a whole. There's an exposure of every single human being. From our own communities, we are being exposed. Our own leadership is being exposed. And we also are being exposed in regards to what side are we on here. And so in that sense, uh, you know, I've gone on this epic rant, my apologies. But, um, you know, these two sorters, they stick out to me at this moment in time. Because um, I think um, we really need to understand how Allah Ta'ala, when he speaks to us about these things, that the point of history and why Allah Ta'ala mentions it in the Quran is to highlight that this has happened before. This is not new to us. And that this is the way you get through it. And this is the way the people of Allah Ta'ala will get through it. Inshallah, I am confident that we will get through it. But I think there's a long way to go still and a lot of hard work to do, Inshallah. SubhanAllah, bro. That certainly wasn't a, wasn't a rant, and uh, it's one way of looking at things because, like you said, generally people are focusing on the uh, the deaths, the death toll, and so on, uh, and and maybe we're not looking at the bigger picture and, and looking back at the uh, the scriptures and and what Islam has has shown us, you know, how people have dealt with these kind of like issues in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, but one thing before we get into our main question, even though Subhanallah, after that. You know, after that section there, it's it's hard to think about discussing anything other than you know, and other than carrying on. But you mentioned uh, about the victory being snatched away and the agitation being linked to that. Mm. What did you mean by the victory? In what sense? Well, in the sense of <clears throat> the Muslims at the time, they believed that they were going to make it into Mecca, right? Okay, I thought you you were referring to today. Okay. Oh no. No, and, and at that at that time, obviously the Muslims believed that we were going to make it, and then the, the Quraysh uh, they 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 have another plan and trick up their sleeve, and so for the Muslims they felt like this was a moment where something had been snatched away from them in that sense, and Allah Taala then had to remind them that this is not the true victory. And I think in today's case in point, I guess the point that we should understand is even though um, uh, thirty thousand people of our people, including actually even non-Muslims, have been killed. Um, even though there is a particular devastation that's taken place in Gaza, and even though there's an attempt to globally suppress the Ummah by putting the, the boot back on the Ummah's global neck, I will say this, that this is, in the grand scheme of things, going forward, this could be a Hudaybiyah moment, and what do I mean by that? Where in the case of Rasulullah, Hudaybiyah was what allowed Muslims to have a level of a breather. Hudaybiyah was what allowed Muslims in Mecca to continuously give their da'wah. Hudaybiyah was the moment in which the Quraysh had to um, particularly take a, a back seat and the Muslims strengthen themselves. And so I'm not saying the analogy is the same. This is why I say the Hudaybiyah moment. But I'm using Hudaybiyah as a metaphor, which is that for all the crimes that have been committed, there have been opportunities and i think we should look at that as well that whereas um there is been absolute pain and devastation as muslims where are the opportunities for us to try to make this dunya a better place and i think that there are opportunities that i hope will be the hudaybiyah moment in which later the fatal makkah moment happens in which the exposure of the duplicity of the west in its treatment towards Muslims and Islam will not only bring the Ummah um, together in terms of resetting and rethinking, but also those who are allies and friends and see themselves as supporters of Islam to say, hang on a minute, what's going on here? And actually all these narratives and stories that people have been saying about Islam and Muslims is just not true. And we're seeing that at the moment, in this emotional moment. We're seeing people converting to Islam. We're seeing people who are turning out and saying, hang on a minute, this is not right, this is not going on. And we're seeing a younger generation, at least, who have been exposed to particular forms of social media saying, wait, this is this is not acceptable. And inshallah, the hope would be that then we can cultivate that to make sure that we this never happens again under our watch. Yeah, inshallah, bro, inshallah. So, I mean... In regards to what we've discussed so far, it's just a teaser for everyone listening and watching. 
What I wanted to do today um, is discuss some important historical events and connect them to the reality of what's happening today, uh, such as what's happening in Gaza. And, you know, maybe we can look at, you know, what can we learn from the past to kind of understand the present and hopefully get an understanding of what what needs to happen next. So, bro, one one thing I definitely need to take advantage of, um, having you on the podcast as a uh, specialist in Ottoman history, and you, you're dressed rightly for this today, um, is it wasn't long ago, 3rd of March, 2024, 100-year anniversary of the uh, abolishment of the Ottoman Caliphate. Uh, or shall I say, more importantly, the abolishment of the the post, the position of the the Khalif of, of Muslims. Um, however, you know, like just from the reaction of people, this event, you know, does it actually mean anything to any Muslims today? In fact, what we're seeing is that you know, we have to question, is it actually even seen as a major event uh, in history? And maybe even the question is, at the time when this happened, was this even seen as a a major event um, amongst the Muslims at the time. So what I'd like to ask you, first of all, um, Brother Yaqub, is maybe, you know, discuss the significance of this event, maybe from a religious, from a political point of view. So over to you, bro. So, I mean, look, um, one of the interesting things today is, I mean, I was, I came to London to do a a workshop for two days on this um, subject. We didn't talk about this subject, but we talked about, uh, re-examining the Muslim world or, or the state of Muslims a uh, hundred years since the fall of the Ottoman Empire, right? Or at least, as you said, the post of the, 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 the Khilafah in that sense. And the idea was, and the idea is still now, and I, I, I sort of teach my students, is a hundred years on, are we satisfied with where we're at? So where have we got to uh, post a hundred years? What sort of milestones can we look at and say, okay, those are milestones that worked in our favour? And what sort of milestones can we look at and say, you know what, the, these last hundred years have been exceptionally challenging in many ways. Now, there are going to be people who um, perceive the idea of the Khilafah as some sort of fantasy and imagination. And there can be multiple reasons for that. They they, they could be um, forms of ignorance. They could be a, a sense of fatigue because of their interactions with Muslim movements who are trying to establish the Khilafah. There could be people who are indoctrinated within certain uh, nation state narratives and whatnot. And that's a position they're going to hold, they're going to hold it. But I do believe this, that since October the 7th, and even prior to October the 7th, I think when the emergence of uh, Daesh happened, when Daesh emerged, presenting themselves as a Khilafah, the assumption was, and in some of the American policy papers, okay. was that this was going to be the nail in the coffin or regarding this idea, that this idea is now done. And, um, you know, finally, um, you know, um, the Muslims can lay this idea to rest. And even in the region, there was, uh, you know, an assumption that, okay, we can just take a sigh of relief and move on with our nation state and national projects. But that didn't quite happen. What happened was that people started asking or, or posing the question, that's not a Khilafah. So clearly, there was enough of a historical memory within the Ummah for various reasons, whether people have been reminding the Ummah of this memory or whether the Ummah are just or also uh, complicit in knowing this memory because of the vast amount of literature that talks about various things in Islam that have amalgamated this notion of the Khilafah within various forms of um, Islamic discourse, whether that be in fiqh, or uh, whether that will be in, uh, you know, Tasawwuf or anything else, that the Ummah were aware at least, or at least factions within the Ummah were aware that, you know, this what Daesh represents is just not what we represent. And what it did is it created a particular phenomena where Muslims were asking me more and more about, um, look, explain something to us about the Ottoman Empire. And this was, in as we've said before, during the wave of, uh, the TV show Diddlish Arturul, right? Now Arturul was not a Khalifa, by the way, but there was a idea at least of good, a good a good ruler and what he represented in that sense. And you can see that there is a, a particular yearning in the Muslims globally, um, in fact, that there has been some form of failure in regards to the culture of leadership. In the region, there was a, a sense of failure because we had witnessed the continued occupation of Palestine, the American invasion of Iraq, um, the um, obliteration of Syria, Libya, 
Yemen and so forth. And then particular, um, you know, governments um, um, acting in particular ways towards their own population. So it created a, a particular sentiment um, in that sense. And so, you know, coupled with all of this sort of like um, recipe of, um, you know, that somehow the Ummah didn't abandon this concept, but asked the question of what it is. Right now, what I recognized was that there was a 600 year black hole in the memory of many people regarding the Ottoman state. So there's an awareness in the region of the Ottoman presence, but what that presence was, was, was um, controlled and regulated by uh, various different factions and forces. So that was the first point. Now, when Gaza has happened, this question has arised again. And it's arised on, on multiple levels. One is, once again, the... I think for the for this younger generation, they feel that there is an they feel powerless, and they feel powerless to be able to stop a genocide, and the genocide is happening openly in their face, and they're being collectively gaslit, and so because they feel powerless, it's forcing the question that we need power, and what is that power, right? Because we have power in the region, but that power is doing absolutely nothing. So as a result of that, it's, 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 it's asking the question of, of, okay, if we are to have an alternative form of power, what would it look like? And does Islam speak of another configuration of power? And is there a form of power and governance that takes place that comes from the ethics and morals of Islam? And that I'm seeing people asking more and more um, in that sense. And I think it's because, and regimes can complain as much as they want, but they, I think they have to take responsibility that they have had multiple failures in regards to safeguarding the interests of their peoples. So that's the first thing in that sense. So um, now going back to in time, then what you see is um, the last time we have a question of a Khilafah is the Uthmani Khilafah. Um, we, some people will deny that and want to go back to the Abbasids. And some people deny all of that and say the only time there was a Khilafah was during the time of the Khulafah Rashidun. Now, the problem with that narrative, in my mind, is that if you do that, you sort of uh, dislocate the Ummah of at least twelve to 1,300 years of history and politics. And then we're, we're no man's land. And I don't do not believe that Allah Ta'ala, when he says he completed his deen, uh, left it in this shape for us to just continuously wander the earth um, for 1,200 years aimlessly. And what you see is that in the Ottoman context, why that is helpful is because it probably can give us the closest imaginations of the possibility of thinking of political uh, sort of configuration that can make sense of the modern world that we live in right now, right, in that sense. So one of the unique things that happens in the Ottoman Empire in 1774 is that Kuchuk Kainarja is a treaty they signed with the Russians after the loss of the Crimea. So imagine the Crimea used to be primarily Muslim. Um, they lose the Crimea, the Khanate of the Crimea. And this is the first time in Ottoman history where Muslim territory has been lost. And there has to be a, um, a question regarding what to do with their Muslims. And so there was a, a, a nervousness amongst the Crimean Muslims with a faction of the ulama saying that we need to move to Istanbul because that's the Khilafah and that's the home of Muslims. And another faction of the ulama is saying, if we leave, if we leave, then all of Islam will be obliterated from this area and there will be no trace of it, right? And this is an interesting question. I'll link it to today because Muslims today who are thinking of Hijrah and whatnot, and this is a question that's also emerging more and more in the Western Hemisphere, yeah are debating a similar question that should we stick or should we twist? Should we stay or should we go? And here, what we see in the case of the Ottoman Empire is those who stayed, gradually their identities were phased out, right? Now, this question also ha happens in Bosnia, during the genocide in Bosnia, actually, in the Bosnian state, in many ways. And so that is our counter-narrative to this, but I'm just mentioning that point. So what Kuchukainaja did is in the Ottoman imagination, it also created the idea that they need to go back one day. And in order to go back one day, they need to try, try to sign in, into the documentation the idea that they are a global khilafah, that they are a khilafah of all Muslims, not just the Ottoman Empire, 
but they have particular jurisdiction within the empire and jurisdiction outside. And they were choosing the chief mufti um, of the Crimea and so forth. Now, what this did was interesting is because for the first time in Islamic history in the contemporary period, it made a, an imagination for all Muslims around the world, right? And even though this was a lost moment for the Ottomans, and it was a moment in which it created real problems in regards to um, its stature in the world arena. The fact that the Russians had signed this document meant that the European powers had to accept this legal document in international law and had to accept that the Ottomans were a Khilafah. And what that did is that also created a particular moment of Muslims around the world who had seen or well, were under the yoke of colonialism. And this is the interesting thing, it's a response to colonialism, in which they were understanding that the Khilafah as an institution and its existence may be able to safeguard the interests of Muslims. Now, why is this important? It's not that um, the Ottoman Empire wanted India to become part of the Khilafah. The Ottomans have a particular understanding of Khilafah, which is that the Holy Lands, Makkah, Medina, and Aqsa, have to be part of the configuration for it to be a Khilafah. What they also believed, however, was that various other Muslim nations could not be a Khilafah to counter them, but can exist as Muslim governments in any shape or form. So what they were doing is they were creating a hierarchy, a hierarchy of, uh, of, of sort of like the Muslim world. And you can see this similar to the United States of America today. The United States of America is an idea empire, an idea state, and it's at the top of its hegemonic world in which it sits at the top and the rest of the European powers in Canada and Australia follow suit. So what the Ottomans were then um, hoping and thinking was, and the reason why this became important in the Muslim imagination, is Muslims realized as minorities, and you've got to remember that the Muslims in the Ottoman Empire were minorities. The majorities were the configuration of non-Muslims. The Muslims of India were minorities. The majorities were actually Hindus and so forth. But what the Ottomans came to conclude here was one, you are either in power as Muslims. Two, you are either aligned with the power configuration. Or three, there is a power, an external power that can safeguard your interests if something happens to you. Right? In the case of the Ottoman Empire, they were power. So they didn't need to worry about that. But in the case of the Muslims in India, and in the case of the Muslims in the Crimea and so forth, for them, the Khilafah was important because there was an existence of a power that was able to put pressure on the external forces to safeguard their interests so that they could survive. Today's India, for example, um, is suffering Muslims in India because there is no agency from places like Pakistan to be able to offer even pressure on India to stop it committing crimes in India and so forth, right? So in this sense, the imagination at the time in 1774 is at least that this institution, irrespective of whether you're under it or not, needs to exist. And the reason why it needs to exist is even if it cannot exert direct pressure under on the, the, the colonial powers who are committing acts and crimes against Muslims in other parts of the world. But its existence, and we do see this up until 24 in the British archives, their concern they had when they were trying to dismember the Ottoman Empire, is the existence of the institution itself still created particular checks and balances on how far the colonial powers could go in regards to their crimes, right? And this is a, a, an important moment. So somebody was asking, um, Norman Finkelstein only yesterday that, it, you know, um, we could have killed 500,000 Palestinians, we, we only killed 50,000. And Finkelstein made the argument, but there are particular sets of norms and laws that will not allow the Israelis to do that because of perception. So that perception is that we're trying to follow international law and they're manipulating it and playing all sorts of gymnastics and games. So even in the Ottoman Empire, the colonial powers, yes, they were still killing people, no doubt about it, and subjugating them, but they had to do a lot of gymnastics right because of this entity's existence in that sense so this is where you start to see globally why the ottoman empire exists and so forth now we have an intensification of that idea of the Uthmanis being a khilafah where within the ottoman empire we start to see uh, the practicing of particular symbolic rituals i Ay Sophia, and the bayat being given in Ay Sophia, and so forth as a way of trying to create um, and strengthen the the, the notion of that and you could argue, and I think one could safely argue, that the reason why the Ottomans doubled down on that idea is because there was a feeling of a sense of weakness. And when you feel a threat, you have to then, um, you know, 
make a proclamation of that um, to, to sort of like stave off any aggression. But within that late 19th century period, which we call the, the Tanzimat period and the Hamidian period, especially during the time of Abdul Hamid II, you start to see um, how the Khilafah as an institution starts to become um, sort of like um, uh, propagate, propagated in the minds of Muslims, both locally and externally, as a way of trying to safeguard the interests of Muslims. Um, and that happens until World War One, and then in World War One we try to, we see a totally different situation, where you would see in 1918 the loss of the Arab provinces, and the reason why this is important is because the loss of the Arab provinces meant the loss of Makkah, Medina, and and Aqsa, right? And a lot of the ulama don't actually um, speak about the necessity of Makkah, Medina, and Aqsa as part of the configuration of what the Khilafah ought to be. But um, in the Ottoman case, the reason why this was necessary was because, um, and I've been looking into this, there's no evidence for this, but this is just my own speculation. So some people have argued that when Rasulullah left Makkah and went to Medina, that the establishment of the, the governance of Islam was even more important than Makkah itself, right? But what you see fundamentally is Rasulullah in his time going back to uh, make Makkah part of the configuration of his uh, state configuration, right? The, the idea of Obudiyah and, and uh, Medina being in the same place. And then he encourages the um, the armies of Osama very early on in his lifetime about Aqsa itself. And then Aqsa is claimed during the time of Omar bin Khattab and because of Sayyidina Abu Bakr and is only alive for two years. What you see is that in the imagination, and this happens in the time of the Khulafa Rashidun, so this is important, that in the idea of the early Khilafah, that Makkah, Medina, and Aqsa are part of a specific configuration because they have a particular symbolic value to Islam that makes it very unique. And so I've said this before, that Makkah is the symbol, global symbol after Fat al of Ubudiyah. It doesn't leave after that. And that after Rasulullah's death, that uh, Medina is the symbol of Nubuwiyah. And Aqsa is the symbol of Jihad, the struggle. And the idea is, is that that struggle will continue to the end of time. And so this is why it was done in the time of Omar bin Khattab. And it's a continuous symbol of all forms of struggle, not just physical, but also in terms of steadfastness and so forth. But this symbol needs to be subjugated under Ubudiyah and Nubuwiyah. They are connected, interconnected in that sense. And you will see continuously in the Quran, Allah Ta'ala, for example, he says, uh, Bismillah, what Dini was they tun, what sinin, wa hazal baladil amin. What he says here is the lands of figs of our olives to Mount Sinai, to the balad that is amin, is Makkah. He's integrated it in there. It's a form of integration. And you see throughout Islamic history, the Aqsa is integrated within the framework of Bilad al-Sham and Mount Sinai in Egypt and so forth and the Hijaz. So there is a particular imagination here that I think we have to just be honest about and take into consideration. And so the idea that you could have a Khilafah in another part of the world, maybe, but fundamentally, we're talking about this region and the Muslim governance can exist around the world. And the reason why I say that is because when the Ottomans lose the Arab provinces, the imagination of creating a, or maintaining a Khilafah in the minds of the Ottomans is a temporary imagination. It's not a permanent one. It's not that Anatolia and parts of the Balkans is going to be the Khilafah. The imagination was that post-World War I, we will do guerrilla activity. The colonial powers will not be able to maintain their existence here, and we would go back and get it, right? This was the imagination, but 24 changed all of that. So when Mustafa Sabri writes in his book on the Khilafah, and he's responded to Sheikh Rashid Ritta, and he says it is possible to have more than one Khilafah, but he was making that case in a vacuum at a time where there was no khilaf. And he was saying, if there are movements that are emerging around the Muslim world, from let's just say Malaysia and Indonesia to Turkey, then you know it's very possible that um, the, the khilaf in Istanbul would not be able to have any jurisdiction all the way in Malaysia. How would it do that? So he was trying to take a geographical thing into consideration, but he pushed the idea primarily that it should be, it should be one. Um, and that, that that is not desirable in Islam at all, and that these are exceptional circumstances. And this leads to another question, which is that should there be a focus in regards to where the Khilafah ought to be? Okay, would it be sufficient working in places like India, Malaysia, 
Indonesia and so forth, which I never have these sort of like symbolic haramain um, um, components to political authority. And I think going forward, what the Ottomans teach us then in that sense is that historically, whether it was the Abbasids, the Umayyads or the Ottomans, that these three holy places gave them a lot of legitimacy because that is also, I think, going forward, part of the configuration. It's not just the implementation of the Sharia and the safeguarding of the interests of the Muslims, but also the safeguarding the interests of the three holy places, which should be under the jurisdiction of the Khalifa in some shape or form, right? And, and so in the Ottoman Empire, I've gone into this sort of rant, but then you have the war in Anatolia, right? The war of independence. Uh, and that changes a lot of things in regards to the imagination of what type of Khilafah ought to be. And in this moment, you have a lot of Muslims writing a lot of works, um, with some making the case that we no longer need a sultanate and that we can have a, a Khalifa that's elected, we can have parliamentary elections and so forth. And other ulama are saying, yes, while that is interesting, if we abolish the sultanate system, they will abolish the Khilafah because they've become synonymous with one another. Because people don't appreciate this. But the Sultanate system became a particular type of hierarchy that had a particular urf to it that created a particular type of decorum in society. And the um, the removal of those visual symbols to some degree stripped the ummah away of various degrees of um, decorum in the way that they behaved with each other regarding political hierarchy, right? And I, sometimes people don't appreciate that. So when in the uh, in the Turkish Republic they remove the hats and so forth, the clothing from the ulama, you, what you're doing is you're stripping someone away from a particular culture of decorum that comes with that symbology. When a doctor wears a uniform, there's a particular behavior that they practice. When a policeman wears a uniform, there's a particular behavior that comes with that, nurse and so forth, right? The ulama, when they wear the uniform, there's a particular behavior. And likewise, the khilafah system as a sultana in the Ottoman Empire at least, had centuries of culture that was stewed in this symbology. And to strip that symbology away meant that you were stripping away a lot of these ideas. My last point is, so in Britain, they made the case that one of the interesting things they found about when they removed hats from people's heads is that it created a particular form of immorality in society. That hat wearing in British society created a particular hierarchy and decorum that when people used to wear hats and then take them off when they went inside. And also, once you removed that and nobody was wearing hats, then it created a different type of culture. Anyway, the point of this I'm making is that the stripping away of all of these layers was what was the problem in the Ottoman Empire. And what I'm trying to do is just help sometimes people understand they may disagree with it, but these layers, why they were there in the Ottoman Empire and why the Ottomans saw themselves as a Khilafah and why the Khilafah was a little bit different in that sense. SubhanAllah, bro. Um, you made many po many points there, to be honest with you. Just to kind of like hone in on a few. Um, you mentioned that, uh, you know, Muslims at that time, even though they were under, you know, colonial rule, they felt like there was a, a big brother. They felt like there was someone there who could kind of look out for them or at least pressurize the uh, the colonialists to safeguard some interests. Uh, what we see is after 1924, that totally vanished. And if you look at it from a point of view now where Muslims totally feel defenseless, and it's a really good example you gave about India because, you know, we know that they just passed that the uh, citizenship rule. It's just been passed in the last couple of days where basically they're going to strip millions of Muslims of citizenship and so on. They've got no one to look out for them. Um, you know, what happened in Bosnia and I think what's happening in Gaza. And what's really interesting is you mentioned the issue to do with power. And it's not like we don't have power. And this kind of links on to the second question I want to ask you about is what, you know, came out of the ashes of the end of the Ottoman Khilafah was nation states. So it seems like there is power there. However, Muslims are still defenseless. So what's your thoughts on the spread of nationalism and, and certainly in the Arab lands anyway? These nation states that are there now with all their tech and all their money and, and all their supposed power who are even bordering what's happening in places like Gaza, however, makes no difference in the grand scheme of things. The early nation states are interesting because I, I saw them, if you look at them carefully, it's like an interregnum moment. 
they are basically holding the fort, the early nationalist states that emerge. So nationalism in the Arab world, and there's been this long narrative about nationalism in the Arab world and so forth, but um, that requires a better treatment because what we see is that the Arab nation states or the Muslim nation states, that includes Albania and, and, and so on, and Turkey, um, they come about during the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, right? So, um, and when we see the way that these projects are actualized, um, I think those early nation states um, still didn't have in their imagination that this was going to be the configuration. Um, general society was still not accustomed to this. This was not something that was part of the imagination. The Ottomans had been in power for the Arab for 400 years. Um, in the Balkans for 600. Um, the idea of the Khilaf had been around for a long time. And if you look at the works of Mona Hassan, Mona Hassan is an academic who wrote a book called um, Longing for the Lost Caliphate. I think that's what it's called. And Mona makes this uh, comparison, uh, Dr. Mona Hassan. And she says that um, she shows the collapse of the Abbasid Khilaf during the Mongol invasion and the sort of works that emerge as a consequence of that, as a way of trying to safeguard that. And then she looks at 1924 and then what happens after that. And the general narrative amongst many uh, protagonists of the nation states um, was that, you know, we just done this and this just ended and we moved on and everybody was okay with it. And what Mona shows that was not the case, that people were not okay with it. People were shocked by it. The ulama were writing long tracts, complaining about it. Muslim thinkers were writing poems in terms of their pain. Iqbal's ones is another example of that. Um, and actually, even in the German khutbah, they were still saying the name of the Khalifa. And there are various um, attempts to revive it with the Khilafat Committee. Um, the Khilafat Committee's attempt was not to revive the, the Khilafat, but the, um, the way to show the support of the Khilafat. But as a result, after the fall of the Ottoman Empire, you have the creation of the state of Pakistan. Because of that, um, you have um, various Khilafat um, conferences taking place about needed to revive the office and whatnot. Clearly, what we see at the time, at least, in that early period, that Muslims have a particular recognition that their political configuration ought to happen in the way that it happened before. So just, just on that point, uh, Brother Yacoub, kind of linked to one of my earlier questions. So when the state was abolished, there was a shockwave throughout, if not through the masses, but certainly with the ulama. I mean, as in, it wasn't just the next day, uh, let's oh, no. move on. Absolutely. Even amongst the masses, absolutely. I mean, like, you know, um, I remember... Uh, my local masjid, the imam used to, he was from India, from Deoband, he used to give a Jummah khutbah with the name of Sultan Abdul Hamid II in it. And I was asking him, why are you saying this, this khutbah? Because it was all he was used to say in Arabic, the mantra was in Arabic. And he said, that's how we were taught. So even the books, you know, um, in, in various parts of the world had that. Um, no, this was a humongous shock to the system. I mean, if you look at even the Egyptians, when the Khilaf is abolished in Turkey, they, they were shocked by it. They never expected it. And if you look at the works of Mustafa Sabri, he was warning them. He was saying, you know, you're celebrating ABCD, but in actuality, this is what the grand scheme is. This is what they're going to do. And they disagreed with him. And then when it happened, there was a, you know, stunt to the system. Now, the problem was, was they had two issues. Well, three issues. One was the colonial now sort of like presence, right? Two was reviving the institution and three was um safeguarding whatever territory they have so that they could survive for another day right um there were obviously um entities and movements who aligned with the colonial powers to establish power so for them this was a new project but what i'm saying is people who were trying to um to, to th were thinking within the, the paradigm of the Ummah, at least, right? The problem was, was that all the infrastructure for the last 400 years was in Turkey and Anatolia. And once the Turks abolished it, starting from scratch in the Arab world, required an exceptional amount of, um, you know, cultural imagination, which I don't think any of them really had. Um, and I think that it caught them by surprise in terms of what had happened in regards to the creation of the Turkish Republic. And then in places like Syria, Iraq, and so forth, there were resistance movements against the colonial existence itself. And then there's the British mandate in Palestine and so forth. So there is a, a, a they are occupied 
um, by a particular force that comes into being and is present there. Um, but the, the wide-scale wide Muslim imagination, um, you can see there's, a, in, there's ample amount of work that supports this now, was that 24 was a shock moment. Um, what happens is the nation states have created this imagination that it was necessary and it wasn't a shock moment because each nation state has the birth of the creation of a nation state, which is a moment of celebration. So you're not going to then talk about something else. And then you create new educational systems and so forth. But this is where Mona's book comes is really helpful because for many Muslims, you know, um, this was a given and they were being told that this is some old granddad's tale. And what Mona had done is say, no, actually, no, hang on a minute, which is surprising. That is one of the few works that came out and did that. I said, hang on a minute, wait, this is not what happened here. Um, and that that shock did send shockwaves because then you, you, why is there a need to create a state for Muslims called Pakistan, right? It's because Muslims in India started to realize that there's, you know, the, the global configuration has changed and that we need a, a state that, that will safeguard the interests of Muslims in this region, because there's no longer an entity that on the, you know, on the global scale at least, that acts as a global power that can safeguard the interests. And the reason why I'm saying that is because many Muslims, secular Muslims in Pakistan, will reject this position. But the point to make here is, is that that part of the Muslim thinking of the Khilafat movement is extracted from the narrative. I'm not saying that that's the main consideration, but it is a consideration for them in India. It is part of the narrative in India. It, this is why the committee comes into being in the first place. And to assume that that was not part of their imagination and it was just a tool they were using for their own gains to create an independent Pakistan or get simply independence from the British is a reductionist approach to the writings of Maulana Kalamazad and the Ali brothers and so forth, who are clearly attached because they are sincere Muslims and so on. Where they have a difference is whether partition should happen or not, whether India should remain one country or India should be partitioned off. And that's a different argument. But the, the emotion of trying to liberate Muslims in India and the liberation Muslim movement in India being attached to the Ottomans winning World War One, and creating this particular imagination of a particular geopolitical sort of like amalgamation of different Muslim entities was part of their imagination for sure. And so when 24 happens, it's a shock to their system too, because Mustafa Kemal, when he abolishes the Khilafah, he abolishes it under the pretext that this was no longer an institution necessary because of the, um, the heroes in the War of Independence like um, Kazim Karabakar, like uh, Raf Alboy, and so forth. Um, they were supporting the Khilafah in Istanbul, but not only that, that the Khilafah committee was sending members from India to pester the Ankara government into um, safeguarding the Khilafah because this was an institution that represented all Muslims. And so when he abolishes it, he makes that case in point that no longer were Muslims from outside of the Turkish Republic get involved in matters to do the Turkish Republic. Now, why is that the case? Because this is what's really interesting. As I said, after 1774, just like Muslims today have a sense of belief that they have agency over the Aqsa question, not only the Aqsa question, but the Muslims of Palestine and the non-Muslims of Palestine, the area itself. And just like how Muslims have a belief that they have agency and a say over Mecca and Medina, Muslims in India believed that they had a say over the Khilafah in Istanbul, even though they were not living in it. And this is an important part of that emotion that is often extracted from a narrative of Muslims in India. And it, it needs to go back. And it's not only India. There's a Sumatra in Indonesia and so forth. In Singapore, where the British had killed soldiers and firing squad because they refused to fight for the British and so on. So, and, you know, and if you look at the records, the French were nervous that the Algerians would rebel against the British and the British were concerned that when they were taking troops from India to Britain, that one of the conditions was that they, they were not going to send them to Mesopotamia, but they would take them to Europe and so on. So they, they were concerned it was there. It's just in the end of the day, um, you know, they were victorious. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah, bro. So, you know, there's something that, from what you're saying, and it's really interesting, and I mean, it answers one of the, the major questions, which was, this certainly was seen as a shockwave uh, through, throughout the, uh, the Ummah. 
for the things that you mentioned, even wow. uh, when the Ottoman Khilafah lost the Arab provinces, the fact that there was a mentality that no worries, we'll just get it back. You know, it, it was just, you know, it wasn't seen as the permanent situation that's going to stay like this. And even when you mentioned, you know, the, when the state was, uh, well, the uh, Khilafah was abolished, we see many Muslims writing and, and the ulama speaking out. Maybe even they looked at history and at the time of the Crusades or at the time of the uh, the Mongol invasion of Baghdad and thought, we've had calamities before. This will pass as well. Um, but what it seems like is it's been 100 years now, bro. And if we, if we do compare it to maybe some of the major calamities that happened in the past, whether it was the uh, ransacking of Baghdad or the Crusades, the Muslims managed to regroup eventually and do what they had to do. After a hundred years, it doesn't seem like some Muslims would look at it from the point of view that it, it doesn't seem like they're any closer to where they need to be. Why Why do you think that is the fact that it's taken a hundred years? The question of Khilafah is there. However, it seems like nation, sta nation states seem like they're here to stay. Um, whilst, you know, if you look at history, yeah, we had lapses, but we were able to regroup. Is that because the institutions were existent, were in existence when we had calamities in the past? And because we don't have the office today, and this is maybe the point you were making that the British knew that as long as the office is there, then there's even that dream people may have to bring it back to power. Do you think that had a major effect in that sense where it's like, thrown into the dustbins of history? I'm going to make three points. Um, so I need to remember. So point number one is, I was talking about Mustafa Sabri a little bit. Uh, when Mustafa Sabri um, uh, um, was part of uh, the constitutional movement in the Ottoman Empire, um, his belief was, um, and you know, I'm, I have to put a disclaimer here for some of your views. The reason why I say Ottoman Empire, okay, because people always bug me on this one. Um, it's 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 just the only word we have available to us in English, okay. So as a way of understanding, sort of it's largely landmass, um, but um, and it's because the Ottomans were not always a Hilafit as well. So we have to try to make that sense. But what Mustafa Sabri does is um, he writes about a constitutional Hilafit, right? So he's he's right, making the case for um, a Hilafit system which has a parliamentary system, which has a constitution in which the the roles of the Khalifa are defined, the roles of society and so forth, the introduction of a free press and so on, right? So he, this is now him trying to create this imagination of uh, a, a, a optimal system in the current world order, right? By World War I, Sabri's ideas shift and change where he's just interested in safeguarding the Khilaf. He said, look, at the moment it's romantic to assume that we can have a constitution of Hilafa, even though the, there are these constitutions being written up until 1921, but you'll see they're reducing and reducing as wartime conditions are, are coming into being um, just to give more powers so that certain things can be executed. Um, so for him now, he can see the threat and he's made an adjustment in that sense. And it's not only until very later on in his life when he's in Egypt. So imagine he was in, he was part of the... Um, you know, revolution in 1908, and now he's uh, in Egypt in 1952, he dies in 1953, a few months before Gamal Abdel Nasser's uh, coming to power. So he's he's seen a lot in that sense. But near the tail end, um, after witnessing World War One and World War Two, his emphasis becomes on safeguarding Aqidah, right? And he realizes that, look, um, and somebody is important because somebody is, I would argue, one of the main thinkers who maintains the idea of the Khilafa in the Arab world um, to some degree. Um, he is the, the Sheikh al-Islam of the Ottoman Empire. And he's the one who's like making sure that you will see the emergence of Muslim movements happens after the death of somebody actually um, in the 1950s, right? And it's no, it's no surprise that this emerges 
post-World War II, post-Cold War, I mean, now Cold War period and so forth. So it's not just suddenly, but um, there is some, the plates are moving at that time. But the point I'm making is that um, he is sitting there realizing over a prolonged period of time that this is a priority. Okay, this is a priority. And the realization for him happens a lot later regarding Aqidah, because for a long time, he would have believed that we can get it back. That okay, we're just we've lost it. We're just around the corner from it. It's only when the reality suddenly sinks into him that okay, right, we need to. I need to do something else. That he decides to write a corpus of work in the hope that the next generation will do something about it. That you maintain the 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 existence of the idea, and then you hope that another group of people will come along and then run with that idea, right? And, and so throughout Islamic history. There has been, um, in the case of the Ummah, this um, this notion of being realistic or recognizing the conditions at the time, but having the foresight of maintaining um, a particular cultural knowledge base that is supposed to provide results for now, but if it doesn't, it will provide results for somebody in the future. And that's the wonderful thing about Islam. So this goes to my second point. Um, I was, I'm working on a piece of work It's called from Badr to Uhud um, The idea that the Ummah have gone through Badr and Uhud moments right? Um, so for example In 1071, Manazgir And we spoke about this before, Al-Parsalan Defeats the Byzantines And that is the first time um, That we see That the Byzantines have been de defeated In this manner By a Sunni Muslim entity And this is The uh, Seljuks and the Seljuks re-established a normative understanding of Sunni Islam in the region. And at the time, there was the Buyids and the Fatimids and so forth, right? And so, and they they bring um, a particular understanding of Sunni Islam back on the map. Um, they are not the only ones. The administration also does that. So you start to see the emergence of Nizam al-Mulk, whose father was part of the Ghaznavid Empire, or entity or state or dynasty. And then you see the emergence of uh, Juwaini, Imam Juwaini and Imam Ghazali and so on, right? And they're writing works now on these questions. So they're not only writing works on Tosawaf and so forth, they write works on political authority and power. They're also petitioning the Khalifa in, in Baghdad. So that's your Badr moment. Um, 20 years later, in uh, 10... Was it 1099, right? You have the Crusaders and they invade Beit al from the Fatimids. So you have a Badr moment, an extreme moment of victory, and then you have this Crusader moment. And Al Hawari, the um, alim at the time, shaves off his head, wears black robes, ties stones to his stomach as a way of, um, you know, this sort of like pain that he's feeling walks to Baghdad and says to the Khalifa, this is what's happening, telling them that women and children are being butchered and killed, and says that there was not a single room, person in the room that wasn't left in tears. And then says to him, like, you know, what's happened to the Persians? What's happened to the Arabs? When did we become so weak? What good are your tears to me now? Do something. That's your Uhud moment. We don't get the Badr moment until 90 years later in 1188 with Salahuddin Ahitin. So understand, you're talking about 100 years, right? So Salahuddin doesn't emerge until another 90 years. For 90 years, it's a cross on Aqsa. For 90 years, it's a horse stable. For 90 years, Muslims, Jews, and Christians are being subjugated by the Crusaders in the region, in that sense. But, but Salahuddin's victory is a Badr moment. All right, so Salah al-Din is now brought Aqsa into the fold, back into Islam. And what happens 50 years later? The Mongol invasion. And the Mongols absolutely decimate the region in that sense. Um, I mentioned about 1453, Fatih conquers Constantinople. And for the first time, the center of a center of Christendom is now part of the Muslim world. That is your Badr moment. 20 years later, Muslims are being kicked out of Spain, right? What you realize, or what you, what the point I'm making about this narrative that I'm trying to construct for you is, is the Ummah kept going, 
Okay, there wasn't this notion of feeling. I mean, at the time, like Hudaybiyah, the Muslims are in pain, they're suffering. This, we have to be steadfast. And this is why I went back to Surah Nasr about steadfastness is not just the everyday steadfastness, is that the Ummah has to be steadfast from generation to generation. And that victory, the Nasr of Allah Ta'ala, is not what we perceive as being victory, but what Allah Ta'ala perceives as victory. And so even though 100 years feels like a long time, in the grand scheme of history, it's not, very, it's not a long time at all. It's not a long time. And that changes happen um, when Allah Ta'ala starts lifting veils. And in our generation, in my generation at least, I can tell you the lifting of particular veils, 9-11 was one. Uh, the um, atrocities in Bosnia was another. The, um, the so-called Arab Spring is another. And now um, the Americans leaving Afghanistan is another. And now October 7. And what this does is it creates a particular accumulation in which you start to see a new generation of people with that level of information available to them and say, okay, we need to go again, right, in that sense. So I don't have that concern personally in that sense because Islamic history has shown me the fact that the idea still resonates and is still relevant in the mind of Muslims a hundred years later is tells me something. It tells me something that they were unable to eradicate this concept and idea in this way, because fundamentally, um, you know, you have to reconfigure Islam totally. Now, going back to the leadership in the region right now. Yes, you're right. They do have power. And I think this is the concerning thing, which is when the nation, the concerning thing is we have power, we're not exercising it. And that's because the ideologies of the nation state and the culture of the nation state fundamentally from what they are in regards to their culture represents something totally different than what uh, a, a Muslim uh, political authority looks like. This is why when I teach people that, or I tell people that when you're learning about the idea of the Khilafah itself, you have to teach it in terms of how is it in terms of a political culture different than what we have right now. What is this ethos? What is this, you know, what does it represent uh, in that sense? And for example, I always explain to people that Khilafah is the idea, which is that it is to some degree um, a continuation of Nabuwa, but it's no longer Nabuwa because Rasulullah is the last prophet. So because it's no longer Nabuwa, there is a deficiency in it in the sense that people are going to be fallible in that sense. And the fallibility of people means that the system recognizes from his inception when Sayyidina Abu Bakr gives his first khutbah that I am not perfect and you're going to have to support me, and that from that moment onwards, the Muslim said we need to continue the agency of political authority, but there's going to be a deficiency in the sense that, you know, we are not the prophet and only the prophet has a particular station in the eyes of Allah Ta'ala in that sense, but we are going to continue this. And as a result, we're going to make mistakes. And that's okay. But fundamentally, we're going to adhere to the two principles, which is what? Obey Allah and obey the Messenger of Allah, Rasulullah. And this is the idea of it. That then concept has a particular culture that goes with it. The current nation states don't have that type of culture in regards to their configuration. They have particular symbols of Islam and so forth. But that, that concept or that culture within the, the framing is missing. In the early nation states, there was that type of consideration, at least. There was. But after World War II, I think a lot changed after World War II with the creation of the State of Israel, to some degree, um, that created a particular type of alternative um, problem in the region. And then the way that the Cold War um, kicks into being, and then you have the contestation between the USSR and the U and Americans, and then various states bringing in different types of military regimes and so forth. And that's the shift that happens in that sense. And so this even the shift hasn't happened overnight. It's been a gradual discursive one. And sometimes our imagination uh, misses that. Yeah, bro. I think the main point really from there is the fact that uh, there, there's no need to be you know, uh, falling to despair because like you said a hundred years in the grand scheme of things in history isn't a long time and it really depends on what outlook and it's subhanAllah amazing point you made at the end that the fact that after a hundred years we are talking the, the discussion of Khilafah is still on the table to the extent where I'm not sure if you uh, are being keeping up to date with the the stuff that's going off in the UK with the new uh, updated 
definition of extremism, which includes, you know, um, the belief in a Islamic state which implements Sharia. The fact that they're trying to legislate in a way to try to get people to stop this, I stop believing in this idea and making it extreme, just goes to show that even through their free discourse and debate, it's there. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a hypocrisy to some degree because they allow a, a Zionist entity to exist based on a particular ethno-religious tradition. But any other group of people that want to believe in a configuration of power that is an alternative to the Western imagination and it comes from their own tradition, is not allowed to even exist in thought. It's not even allowed to exist in thought. And that is, is something which um, tells you everything you need to know in many ways, that you can't even exercise a open dialogue and conversation. Um, one could have an open dialogue and conversation and disagree with all of it, fine. But even to want to engage in that conversation is, is not permitted anymore. And I think that's a problem because that says something about Western society, which is, um, that they are trying to um, police the thoughts of Muslims in many ways. And, you know, um, it's not only the thoughts of Muslims. Fundamentally, they're going to police what we can teach and what we can't teach from our own tradition, right? Um, and, and that's part of the problem uh, in, in many ways. What they fail to understand, and I, I believe this, is that their duplicity in terms of what they have done means that they're on their last legs. Um, the empire is in trouble. Now, that could be another 50, 60 years. The nation state may double down because of what's taking place. And I guess that's what we're seeing in the United Kingdom, a doubling down on national identity of what it means to be, I wouldn't even say British, but what it means to be English in many ways, and trying to create a, a state that adheres to what they call English values. Um, and as a result, it's very clear from a civilizational plane and this is why civilizational sort of discussion is important, because when Benjamin Netanyahu is making the case that, you know, um, he's part of a particular civilization, it is true that the Zionist entity is a European construction. It is a representation of Europe in the Arab world. And what it has done, the Zionist entity, is that it's abandoned Judaism to some degree, because it's secular, amalgamated itself with Western secularism, couch surfed on Christianity, uh, secular Christianity as part of this new civilizational project, and then otherized Islam as being the alien in the region. You know, it's bizarre. You've come from Europe and settled here and then telling everyone from the region that, you know, your ideas don't deserve to be here in many ways. And that's um, kind of strange to me and I don't think it's sustainable I just don't think it's sustainable um, because you know the Muslims are in the region and are here to stay and they're not going anywhere because we've been here for a very long time and what you realize very quickly is all the narratives and the lies that they've been spreading about Islam are just becoming exposed yeah one last uh, question I have uh, Rudy Yacoub um and, and this is actually linked to the whole discussion. It's it's not uh, something which is you know external to it. Um, and because obviously you teach Islamic studies as well. Uh, and one thing which I want to pick your brains on is the question of the Sahaba. And there's uh, one clip I listened to on the uh, Muslim Thinking podcast when you mentioned about uh, the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam investing in the people the, i.e. The, the sahaba were the institutions and if you think about it the events of what happened in Darul Arkham when the, the, the messenger وسلم, was culturing the sahaba where he was building these institutions as you describe it this was in order to get them ready to change the society from kufr one to Islam and if you look at the situation in the ummah today where we also require a change how can we you know, take lessons from Sahaba to you know, motivate us and use as a template to actually work towards this change? You know what's unique about the Sahaba is that we only speak, at first we only speak about the Sahaba, the very few Sahaba that, that we read about from time to time. 
But actually, if you read the books, there were hundreds and hundreds of them. Like it, this just kind of gives you the example of the work and the effort that Rasul had done in regards to cultivating these people. And what's unique is that when Rasul dies, Sahaba go to all corners of the world. And not only did they go to the corners of the world, but wherever they went, they established Islam. It says something about their character. It says something about their their ability uh, of, of understanding Islam in terms of the way that Rasulullah cultivated them. We are fortunate, alhamdulillah, that we are fortunate that we have access to um, some of the few, like the Khulafat Rashidun and so forth, and then we can learn from those experiences. But I always encourage people to read firstly about all the, um, the Sahaba that we can get access to, like Zaid. Zaid was the adopted son of Rasulullah and then um, you know, he, he dies in the Battle of Muta, radiallahu an, and a phenomenal Sahaba who Aisha al-Anha says that if there was going to be a Khalifa after Rasul Sallam, it would have been him. And it was his son Usama, radiallahu an, who was sent in regards to uh, Bilad al-Sham, right? And what you realize here is that Rasul Sallam then, in regards to his message, he imbues his message into the people itself. And the message then is not just an, an intellectual endeavor, however, it's a spiritual and religious endeavor. When he's creating their character, he's not simply creating their character uh, as a way of being politically or intellectually aware. He's creating their character in regards to them being spiritually focused, them being religiously apt, them being upright in their character and their disposition. This type of investment requires a lot of effort and hard work. And so this is the type of um, Muslim that's required now in terms of the change that we want. We actually want people to replicate Sahaba, not in the sense Sahaba guaranteed the Ashram of Ashram and Sahaba guaranteed Jannah. That's not what I mean here. In their effort, in their endeavor, in their taqwa, in their understanding of deen. I mean, so many Sahaba were mushtahids. So many Sahaba knew fiqh. So many a Sahaba, you know, were spiritually tight. The assumption is, is that, you know, that only a few of them uh, had some sort of like spiritual uh, positionality in regards to Muslim leadership throughout Islamic history. That's not true. I'm not talking about Sahaba here. I'm just talking about Muslim leadership. Many Muslim leaders, you know, um, had an attachment to the Quran. Many Muslim leaders um, had an understanding of Sunnah and so on. And so I feel like um, the, the model, the Sahaba model, in this sense, and I think this is something that's often missing, and this is the uniqueness of Islam, is that we have Rasul and then we have the Sahaba, and we should look at the Sahaba, the model of the Sahaba itself, because the Khilafah concept comes from the model of the Sahaba in of itself, in the sense of the way that it configured in those first four generations, or four people, sorry, is that we need to investigate not only the character of Rasul but the Sahaba as a unit, in regards to what they reflected and represented it as people who followed Rasul and then people who continued after Rasul and what was it in their character as an in, as individuals, but fundamentally as a collective, that created a particular space. They were a particular type of intellectual and religious leadership that we have yet to see. Whenever the Muslims represent any form of intellectual and religious leadership that is amalgamated together, they have historically done unique things, right? And so what we're looking for in our leadership culture then is people who reflect that model of the Sahaba, where they have a particular intellectual understanding of their surroundings, where they have an attachment to their deen in a way which is exemplary. Um, and, you know, this is why when we talk about the Khulafa Rashidun, it's interesting. They are Rashidun because of their character, not because they're Khalifa. It's, it's, it's for that reason that they are exceptional Sahaba as people in terms of, and these became models and yardsticks for us. And I think that requires, once again, a better reading of history, of understanding who these people are, all mistakes and all, to understand what it meant to belong to a, a corpus or a circle of people who fundamentally not only egged each other on in regards to their, their dawah, 
they egged each other on in regards to their spirituality, in regards to the memorization of Quran, in regards to getting closer to Allah Ta'ala, because fundamentally we're trying to please Allah Ta'ala. And it's very possible that you may not see the fruits of your labor. So I, I've given this narrative before, that when you see Amar ibn Yasir, when he was tortured, radiallahu anhu, when he was tortured and killed, sorry, not tortured and killed, that's not for Allah, when his parents were tortured and killed, and Rasul Salam said that, you know, I give them Jannah. Uh, or, you know, the Jannah is awaiting for them in that sense. Rasul Salam can't give, you know. Anyway, the point I'm making is that um, if I was to say to Amar at the time, um, you know, that, um, Ya Ahmad, you're going to see, um, you know, um, we're going to make it to Medina. And Ahmad, we're going to do, um, we're going to be victorious at Badr with only 333 men. And Ahmad, we're going to do Fatal al Makkah. And Ahmad, we're going to see the conquest of Aqsa. I wouldn't be surprised if Ahmad is sitting next to me at that time, if I tried to console him and tell him this, just after his parents had been killed. And even Rasul Salam telling him that Allah Ta'ala has given them Jannah, that he just looks at me and goes, are you really kidding me right now? Are you kidding me? But Ahmad witnessed every single one of those events, every single one of them. Um, he outlived Rasul Salam. And throughout that time, there were people dying on their way in the process. And um, he was continuously... Um, um, witnessing those events and there are some people in, in, in history where Allah Ta'ala makes them witnesses so that they may see things um, as a reminder and testimony to the rest of humanity in terms of what happened and Ammar is one of those people this is why then Rasul Salam, the hadith of Rasul Salam, that, the one that, that you know kills Ammar is the one who's the wrongdoer in that sense right so um, the point I'm making is once again that process that the Sahaba understood that they may not see the end goal of their process, but they had a particular type of um, understanding of their environment. They had a particular understanding in regard to the da'wah, and they had an exceptional amount of taqwa, and they were very spiritual and religious. They woke up for tahajjud. They did istikhara. They fasted on Mondays and Thursdays. They did all sorts that you can imagine as a way of being closer to Allah Ta'ala that gave them that in heightened sort of like feeling of then continuing with the project. And I think that aspect of the Sahaba as an amalgam of both dunya and akhirah is sometimes missing, right? And I think those are the types of, going back to Dirlis Arturu, that's the type of leadership that that mythology created. And you can see that Muslims subscribe to that. So then my last point is, is that if we are going to take the responsibility of being in positions of leadership and we don't take that, the Ummah gives it to us, but we have to somehow reflect that. We have to be of exceptional character um, for, for being a representative of Islam requires a particular type of character. And then Allah Ta'ala like elevates you in the sense that people remember you. And I think that's what's needed right now. And that's not easy. We are flawed. We are perfect. And Allah Ta'ala in his rahmah permits us that. He permits us of being flawed. But the effort and the endeavor to try to get close to him is what provides the alternative. And the political vision, the religious vision, the spiritual vision is embodied in the people. Embodied in the people. And then the people are the ones who operate in the systems. So this is why it's important, um, I think. And this is why historically the ulama always write about the character of the Khalifa over the culture of the Khilafah. In the end of the day, it, they want to make sure that the person who's in charge, the buck stops with that person, and that person has to be of a particular quality. Because in the end of the day, we are human beings. And I think that's important. But there's a lot to learn from the Sahaba in that sense. And I want people to understand that the uniqueness of Islam was he, Rasul Salam, our master, um, achieved exceptional things, but he was able to do it because he was able to cultivate a group of people that had a belief in him and Allah Ta'ala and his deen, and then they were able to internalize it in the way that he he wanted them to internalize it. They say that when Rasul Salam was sick and he pulls the curtain and he sees that the Muslims are praying Salah and saying Abu Bakr is leading it, that he smiled. He understood that, okay, I'm happy. My people can now take this on. And I think that's that's a type of um, 
character we need to start creating. And that requires effort, but inshallah, it's not beyond us. It's in our tradition. Subhanallah, bro. Subhanallah. I'm just uh, a little wary of time. I know you have a uh, another podcast scheduled um, very soon. So I don't really, I want to give you a bit of a, a breather between now and then. Um, but I will, as usual, bro, um, ask you for any final thoughts, any final message that you want to you wanna deliver, you want to give any words of motivation. To be honest with you, everything you've said so far is uh, uplifting and motivating. However, there's any any uh, any comments that you want to end with? Yeah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, so, firstly, um, I you know I've been I've been seeing this more and more. For, um, if there's any shortcomings of mine in this podcast, sometimes when we speak, you know, sometimes people they 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 jump on when we're speaking on this podcast in the comments about he said this and that. And sometimes I, I just want to tell the audience that they don't appreciate that when you're speaking live feed, you don't have the opportunity to, to correct or recorrect yourself sometimes um, in terms of, and that can happen in a regular conversation. So if I've done anything of that nature, that please forgive me in that sense. And may Allah forgive me in this month of Ramadan. Um, but in this month of Ramadan, I am making the case that this is a month of reflection and we should use this month more now than ever to reflect on what's just happened, not only in terms of the far, past five months, but, but the past hundred years, and how can we be different? Now is not the time to feel sorry for ourselves. Now is not the time to uh, to be despondent. Now is the time to be Muslim. I said this in other podcasts. Now is the time to stand up and be accounted for. You know, they say in English, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Now is the time. Now is the time to be those people who wants to seek the pleasure of Allah Ta'ala. One thing I've learned from Islamic history, this is not supposed to be easy. This was never easy. The ple Seeking the pleasure of Allah Ta'ala is not some easy feat. Allah Ta'ala has expectations from us. If the people of Gaza are guaranteed Jannah for their martyrdom in regards to what's happening to them, imagine the types of effort that need to go in in regards to what we need to do to be um, accepted by Allah Ta'ala. In, in Jannah itself. And it doesn't mean that we need to, 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 to be martyred necessarily, but it's the effort that Allah Ta'ala requires um, in regards to um, the actions that we are doing, which has to be of a scale of magnitude that every ounce of fiber in your body is working towards pleasing your maker. And we have to be honest about that. Though. Are we doing enough of that? If the answer is yes, then we wouldn't be in the situation we're in right now. The failure of, of, of what happened on October the 7th has been a systematic failure over a prolonged period of time. And the Zionist entity knew, and they calculated correctly to some degree, that we will get away with this and nobody would do anything. Where they have miscalculated, unfortunately for them, in their hubris and arrogance, is that they have forgotten that Allah Ta'ala is watching everything. And Allah Ta'ala will pass his judgment upon them. And they're not going to escape. But Allah Ta'ala in his rahmah even gave them authority and power. And then we'll say on the day of Yawl Qiyamah, you said you were the chosen ones. You said that you were more civilized than the rest of them. You said that you were better than everyone else. So I gave you power. I gave you authority. What did you do with it? What did you do? I gave you my messenger. I gave you my Quran. You were surrounded by Muslims. What did you do? Is this what you did? Is this the crime you committed? Can you have any excuses now? Can you have any excuses that I only picked the Muslims to be in authority? I gave you a chance. You failed. And so in that sense, they need to understand that one, Allah Ta'ala is watching everything. Two, that the Muslim, the Ummah, the Dunya is watching and now they are changing their opinions. Now they are seeing you for what you are, alhamdulillah, you know, for all the crimes that you've committed for over the last 75 years in the region, and the ex by extension of that, the amount of crimes that have been committed by many governments, including the Americans and the West in that sense, it's just been unacceptable. And maybe, just maybe now, this is that moment. And then October the 7th, may this be a moment of self-reflection. Let's say, okay, you know, enough of this. And not only self-reflection in terms of, like, as a collective, as a community, but as individuals. You know, we are all polluted. We are all polluted by capitalism and neoliberalism. We don't like to admit it, but we are because it's hegemonic around the world. And I really think that the level of sacrifice that's needed to make the change is to re-examine the way that we're living our lives right now. 
You know, in this Ramadan, I am uncomfortable eating food, knowing that there are people being starved deliberately by a particular state. And so, alhamdulillah, to whatever we eat, but we have to be conscious and aware of the fact that, you know, our people are suffering. And in that sense, I'm not saying that the, the suffering of people in Palestine is more or less than the suffering of Muslims around the world. I was at a, um, you know, event yesterday where well, Muslims from around the world who were talking about the challenges they're facing. But what I am saying is that October the 7th, nonetheless, should be a turning moment for us. Okay. And this is an Aqidah issue. And the, the, the thing that concerns me is we're going to see one or two things in our lifetime. Either the liberation or the destruction. One of the two is happening. And Sheikh Dido said something interesting last week. I was listening to him from Mauritania. He said, after the abolishment of the Khilafah, Aqsa took the uh, the sort of like pressure of that symbolism in, in regards to that. And it's very, and when you were talking about a hundred years ago, when the Khilafah was abolished, how did people feel? We need to start asking ourselves, if we see the abolishment of Aqsa, how will we feel? Okay, and we have become quite complacent and lazy in assuming that that might not happen. But the people of Gaza have been saying it for a while. First Gaza, then Aqsa. They've known it for a while. And if we've watched 30 and more, 40, 50, 60, thousand of our people, children, women killed in this way, and we haven't moved, then, then something is horribly wrong with us. So maybe we can't do something right away. But the mindset needs to change. This is the moment. And insan is, is really bad in the sense that they forget. They get sloppy. They get lazy. They go back to their ways. We cannot go back to our ways. From now on, the world has to look different for us. And it can never be the same. And we're going to go forward and we're going to try to change it, inshallah. So this is, this is, this is it for me now. You know? um, and it sounds strange, but we're going to have to be brave. We're going to have to be brave in, in what we believe. Um, we exist in this dunya, not because for the West, but because Allah Ta'ala, he's our Rahman and he created us without my permission. And he put me in this dunya here, alhamdulillah, to work for his mission. You know, there's a group of people that say they are chosen by God. We chose Allah. We chose him. So we should start doing his work, inshallah. So, so now's the time to keep moving, bro, inshallah. That's the only advice I can give now. Now's not the time to be lazy. And this Ramadan should be not only a moment of spiritual reflection, but a moment of where we at, as you said, it's been a hundred years where we at right now, and uh, so that we can move forward, inshallah. Just like a hair, bro. Um, there's nothing really that I could add to that. I think it's really important self reflection. Um, and this is the moment, you know, and like you mentioned earlier on at the start, the differentiator. You know, many people have described the what's happening in Gaza as the Furqan, and you know, it's just gonna. It's going to expose which side people are on. And it's better that people reflect um, themselves. But bro, I'm going to inshallah bring the podcast to a close. Uh, I do need to mention though that uh, apologies for people listening or watching. There is a distortion. I'm not sure if uh, brother you, you can hear when, when I'm speaking. There's a distortion. I hope that it doesn't go through to the recording. Um I'm not sure if you can hear it, but uh, but to be honest with you, it doesn't really matter because when you have Brother Yakub on the podcast, people don't want to listen to me, they want to listen to the main man. So uh, I can just stay silent and just absorb, mashallah, what's, been, what's, been, what's coming my way. Uh, but yeah, definitely, you know, for anyone new to the podcast, please make sure that you uh, subscribe and like the video and share this with family and friends. Um, and really, it was a pleasure, Brother Yakub, to get you on. Uh, I know it's been a while. And uh, you're a busy guy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you in all your efforts and everything you do. Mm. And uh, hopefully, inshallah, at some point in the future, we can probably do this again. Mm. On that note, until the next one, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.